everybody is here for the Oregon City Resources Committee meeting. Uh, it looks like, and I know we had an interest from Damon Schronk as well and sent him a link to the meeting. He'd be joining us for public comment. Um, but we'll see if he knows. Um, we don't need to wait for that. Uh, I also wanted to take the beginning of the meeting just to uh, a couple of new employees with the plan division. So, Nancy, we need to call the meeting to order, right? Mm -hmm. well, let's go ahead and get it started at the one. So, I call the August 10th meeting of the Natural Resource Committee to order. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Pete Walter, and I'm the planning manager for Oregon Planning. I'm very happy to let you know that we are uh, finally staffed back to where we were uh, with the hiring of uh, two assistant planners, and they are Molly Garvin, Garvin and Jude Tadeus. So I'm going to allow those guys to say a little hello to you and introduce themselves. And, um, Jude, why don't you kick it off and unmute? Sorry, I was having a hard time finding the my cursor on the thing. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Jude Tadeus, and uh, I am one of the two new assistant planners for the uh, development here at Oregon City. And uh, I'm extremely excited to get started and get get to work for this uh, fantastic city. Uh, just a couple things about me. I graduated from Portland State with my master's in urban and regional in 2021. And I've pretty much been a life, lifelong um, resident of the Portland metro area. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Jude. And hi all, I'm Molly Gorin. Um, I'm also a new assistant planner with Oregon City. Also very excited being, um, in this really great community. I'm new to the area. I just moved here from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and so I've been here about six weeks and I'm loving it. And um, yeah, I'm excited to get to know you all who are part of the Natural Resources Committee. Yeah, Molly and uh, Jude have been so busy that they have hardly been introduced around the city to staff yet. So um, <laughs> we are hoping that they can actually get some time to um, get the lay of the land and at least figure out where east and north and south and west is in this crazy layout that we call a city. Um, <laughs> so that'll be happening too. But thanks, guys, for jumping on board. We're really happy to have you with us. Yeah, welcome to um, Oregon City. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Well, we'll see you guys later on. You're welcome to stay, but I know you're you probably got other plans. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And let's see what's next on our agenda. I think we're going straight into interviews if we don't have any public comments. Yeah, I believe that's where we're at, is we'll be ready for the interviews. So. Great. Well, I know it's been a long time coming, so uh, thank you for your patience, all, all of you, especially Emily as well. Uh, welcome, Emily, and uh, it's good to see you. Um, we have a list of standard questions always asked over the years. Um, um, normally we do that in a kind of a round robin, but with the Zoom format, how can I do it, Nancy? I don't know. Oh, we could just take turns asking questions. Like I could ask one and yeah. Sam can ask two and Devin can ask three and then I can ask four. And then <laughs> so, sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank yeah, you. As you can see, we're down several members. We have two that aren't here tonight, and then we're down to just in general. So we really are thankful that you applied. Um, so one 
do please tell us why you're interested in serving on the Natural Resources Committee. Yeah, um, I've been here for almost two years now. Um, I spend a lot of time outside, um, hours every day, um, and I'm especially interested in um, ecological health of the city um, as it pertains to wildlife habitat and increasing safety for the human residents of the city. Um, I, I just love plants and animals. Um, I just want to see our, our local ecosystems as healthy as possible. Okay. I'll go next. So what is your background in natural resources? Yeah, um, my background in natural resources is not fit um, neat into a traditional education model. Um, I fee from Hartwick College. Um, I spent most of my time in college so traveling and doing field work in national parks all over the world, um, mostly in areas of very high biodiversity, including uh, Madagascar, Peru, Honduras, and Ecuador. Um, despite not having a major related to natural resources, I did take significant coursework in biology, anthropology, uh, consumer culture, and statistics. Uh, I think my most relevant experience though pertains to natural resources um, is my experience with integrated pest management. Um, I'm self-employed. I'm a nursery plant nursery owner. I started that business in 2016. And I work full time doing that. Um, I grow over a thousand species of plants and probably have close to 9,000 um, individual plants in my inventory at any given time, um, many of which are native to this area. Um, over the past eight years, I've formed and kind of worked working on fine tuning um, and integrated pest management that um, focuses on organic pest treatment. Um, I so I look a lot and um, safety data sheets for various pesticides, um, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides. Um, I didn't use a lot of herbicides because I grow mostly indoors. But um, yeah, I, I read a lot about um, ways in which pollutants can enter the environment. And um, yeah, I've developed a pretty rigorous quarantine protocol for new plant material. Um, and I've been kind of keeping up to date on a lot of the um, ecological threats in in our state, um, including, yeah, the, the ash borer recently. <laughs> awesome. Um, <clears throat> have you previously served on an appointed advisory committee or, or board? Um, not specific to Oregon City, um, but uh, I lived in Portland prior to moving to Oregon City, and I was the treasurer uh, for the People's Colloquium, a nonprofit um, that offers free education in the arts and humanities, and I was treasurer for five years. Um, I'm current treasurer of the Pacific Northwest branch of the American Begonia Society, um, an active committee member. Uh, and those two are elected positions. Um, and then appointed positions, um, let's see, I'm a committee member for the Conservation Committee of the uh, American Begonia Society. Um, and in high school, I was the president of the Amphibian Steward Network, a um, conservation initiative focused on optimizing genetic diversity of tropical captive uh, populations. Um, and that was uh, primarily work that was um, writing and implementing of tax on management plans. Uh, four, their question four. Um, are you pre are there specific projects that you feel the Natural Resource Committee should pursue? Um, and would your answer change if you didn't if there weren't any budget constraints, which of course there are, but just <laughs> um, and and if you know, funding wasn't an issue, what would you do? That's a very fun question. Um, we think. Yeah, so I think primarily I would want to signal boost and assist with any current projects, um, including I think, you know, heritage tree nominations, um, urban tree inventory and um, preservation of tree canopy. A few things that I, I guess would like to see, but I don't know if it falls um, within the scope of the NRC, um, but efforts to address climate change um, and a priority of working with um, indigenous populations, the Grand Ronde, the Umatilla, Warm Springs, Yakima tribes um, to restore habitat um, and public places and city operations, um, mitigation of natural areas, um, in natural areas of high use um, of gas powered power tools and vehicles that this is, uh, planting of pollinator habitat 
in areas currently maintained as turf lawn and public parks and roadsides. Um, you know, potentially could include things, I guess, it, yeah, again, if it was not an issue, um, phasing out traditional road lighting to something that minimizes light pollution. Um, I think that's kind of a, a high bang for your buck and an easy thing to do. Um, and some species are such a problem. I'd love to see targeted birds, not just to remove those, but to restore the habitat so that um, they can be managed with less human intervention long term. In private spaces, I guess, again, if funding is not an issue, um, something like, you know, increasing education, focus on planting native species, um, implementing more stormwater ponds. I see them every so often, but, you know, it'd be nice to see more of those. Um, solar infrastructure, pesticide education, outreach, safe disposal opportunities. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> there are other things, but. <laughs> I hope you have a list of those. <laughs> I was writing as fast as I could. <laughs> oh, that's great. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for, from the committee? Or if not, do you have any questions for us? Yeah. Family? I guess I have one Sam, question. Sam. It's more of a time commitment question, mm -hmm. so less yeah. of a natural resource specific question. So it's clear that you're enthusiastic and well suited to the work that natural, the natural resources committee does, but we need to have people participate in the meetings. Do you feel like you have the time and availability to meet um, once a month as we do at this time? Like, are you able to meet these meetings? Yeah, definitely. Um, I I think that that's a really that's a really fair question. Um, I don't know if I also have a baby, so that's definitely something that I've been thinking a lot about time management. Um, but I think in the past um, I've worked two jobs, so I think that right now I just have one job. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I think that I think I definitely have time, especially if the meetings um, continue to be offered virtually. I think in-person meetings would, of course, be harder. But um, being self-employed, my work schedule is incredibly flexible, um, and the time and days of meetings doesn't really make any difference at all. And if that were to change, like I can just as easily meet at you know seven in the morning as uh, you know at seven at night. It doesn't really that doesn't make make such a big difference. Um, yeah, but that's that's a very very fair question. <laughs> Yeah, several of the members have children, small children. So, you know, we're, we're understanding of that. <laughs> One moment, I'll close my office door. I'll be right okay. back. Are there other questions from the committee? I can't think of any. And maybe, does she have any questions of us? Um, I do, if no one else has other questions. Um, yeah, I guess, like, is there anything that, um, if I should serve on this, that I should, like, recommended reading? Or, I mean, I've been perusing, like, the, the comprehensive documents and all the city code that um, pertains to the NRC. But are there, I mean, especially not having, like, a, um, a formal education in you know, city planning or anything um, like urban forestry that um, would be beneficial in particular for me to read? Um, well, there's probably a lot of um, improvement that we can make to the city's websites. And, and that's one of our long-term goals is to uh, try to keep the information that's on the city's website with respect to natural resources current. Um, but I would encourage you to go and check out what the planning division has up as far as, you know, natural resources information and that sort of thing. Um, planning, uh, the planning division staffs the natural resources committee, but the planning division has, does not actually control any land in the city other than through regulation of private property and zoning and overlays and that kind of thing. So I think getting familiar with the natural resources overlay district um, code in if you're interested in code um, that's on chapter 1749 of the city code on the website and then we also have the Willamette River Greenway overlay district which is another uh, overlay and the geologic hazards overlay zone as well 
we also have a public street tree code section, a, a development code section for trees. And uh, so I'm referring to chapters 12.08 and 71. So that's a lot of code. Um, and it's important because it, um, you know, that's how we evaluate all applications that come in uh, for development. Um, so uh, on top of that, the heritage tree program itself, which is a, a uh, separate program entirely um, that is for designation of heritage trees on private and public property. Um, if you're interested in, in getting more involved in that, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done there as well and getting, you know, I, I think making aware of the program and augmenting the program and through volunteer efforts. So those kinds of things are important. I'm sure the committee has a few suggestions. Thank you. Pete, I have just a couple of questions. One, remember we did the mini planning kind of education thing at the last meeting and we were going to do, she was going to come back and do planning 101. Um, and we thought if we got a few new members that that would, that would be, be a really good thing because, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know half of that stuff. So, you know, it's always really good to hear. So right. we should definitely put that on an upcoming agenda. Yeah. And then the uh, second thing mm -hmm. is, okay. has the city commission approved the updated street tree list? Um. It is going to a work. Uh, but Sam and I went to a workshop uh, session uh, and no, presented I'm thinking it, of but, something else. Yeah. Um, uh, it hasn't been approved yet. It's going. That's right. Today they mentioned it's going to be on the consent agenda. Okay. So um, they decided to do that. But with respect to anything related to trees, there may be interest in pulling it off the consent agenda to discuss the um, direction. Sorry, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> Please don't come in. Thanks. <laughs> Vacuum guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You need your office cleaned. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, what was I? Oh, yeah. Consent agenda. They might pull it off to talk to uh, the commission about what direction they would like the city to head in updating a public street tree code. Right. Because uh, we did make a recommendation mm -hmm. for that one for the the parking strips that are less than three feet so right and just to double check the timing on that uh, sorry you're right with you so emily if you go look at the street tree list we've changed it <laughs> <laughs> we spent like a, over a year and sam did a lot of the legwork on that she really deserves a lot of credit for that but so we modified it to take into account climate change and droughts and heat waves and ice storms and, you know, you know trees actually should be planted in what <laughs> areas. It took all the ash trees off the list and most of the maples off. And, and there's apparently some maple pest now up in Washington somewhere that I was hearing about the other day. I'm like, great. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, so the street tree list adoption is tentatively scheduled for August 17th on the consent agenda with uh, Aquila and Jude, who just met, predicting that effort. The actual direction on the street tree code update is scheduled tentatively for September 13th at a work session with City Commission. Okay. Um, so we may want to get our ducks in a row before then right. so that um, do, do, so, do some of us do they want any of us to go or yeah uh, um let's do that um i haven't really fleshed it out with it at all and but i think uh it would be there needs to be some public outreach obviously it would be a legislative process at the tail end uh, so to adopt it um 
whereas the street sheet code doesn't need that kind of right. process because we're not changing policy. We're just changing the list. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would say for work sessions, they don't typically invite public comment, but if we can get something together before then, um, that would be good. Uh, we went to the um, one work session where we presented right. the street Cree and, and also the, the code change, all the reasons for it, but we're more than willing to go back and, and address that again. Yeah. If you have any questions? Yeah, we we'll, we'll can put all that information in the agenda again. And uh, Aquila and I and you guys can probably talk offline without having to uh, worry about public meeting code or serial meetings, which we've all been schooled in. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I think we can probably do that uh, without any any problems so let's do that okay. uh, um, any other questions for us Emily uh, I don't think so thank you great well you're welcome to stay and listen to the rest of the meeting I think we were gonna talk about what's up next in communications yeah I will stay thank you <laughs> yeah yeah, communications. We're going to talk about Emerald Ash Borer, I believe. Right. So <laughs> I've gotten a little feedback to date, but um, I haven't heard back from the Public Works Department yet. I've heard from from Parks, and I would like to invite John Waverly and our right of way manager Dante Posadas, who deals a lot with um, city public trees between and um and john um i think we can get a pretty good summary of what they're doing on city on land um as far as a response um but i would hear from uh, samantha about her her training with the RIS program I briefly looked at the city of Portland's website for Emerald Ash Border Borer, and I think, at least for planning, it would be behoove us to put up a website in the same format, um, which has links to the OSU service information and the resilience plan itself. But uh, we can talk more about that after we yeah. discuss this yeah well let me pull up so i sent some notes um earlier so let me pull those up because um, they had like a short list of activities to do but they're like big activities if that makes sense <laughs> yeah that's a, so it's not that's like a problem so it's an easy way harder to do um so essentially, um, Emerald Ash Borer is a highly prolific um, pest targets ash trees. And it um, was first introduced into the United States back in 2002, back in my old hometown, home state, Michigan. And um, it came in through shipping materials and quickly established and started attacking the native ash trees um, in that area. And by 2007, it started to quickly spread across state lines um, into Canada and all, of, all over the eastern, um, northeastern um, area. So it's very, it spreads very quickly. And it primarily targets ash trees. It does have other host trees, um, but ash is a native tree that is has a variety of species across the entire United States. And Oregon ash is a riparian tree here in our state um, and was in tests has been shown to be particularly vulnerable. Meaning as soon as it establishes, um, the trees are not likely to 
are very easily to be to the past and um and then thus die and then create ultimately a source of hazard material and waste material for municipalities to then deal with because it's an invasive pest the wood has to be carefully quarantined and we cannot plant it um these are not going to be able to plant the stocks that they have um and we so we can't plant it any wood that comes down cannot be um, distributed as firewood um and it can't spread across lines it has a very short um space that it can be in so that means we have to be anticipate um what we will do when eab gets here because it can travel 20 kilometers in a season and that's basically right now it's grove and kilometers is well, oregon city within that radius um so we can expect it to arrive here soon if it's not here already. And for a mature tree, we probably not know a given tree is infected at eye level until it, that tree has been infested for multiple years. And by the time they've observed it in forest growth, they've estimated that it has been established there for at least the last five years. So it's not easily recognizable in first flush when EAB arrives. So are there any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, I've, my neighbor mentioned that it has a D, the borer has a D-shaped exit hole. At, and at, at what point would you see that? So you wouldn't know um, unless you're looking at every tree very carefully um, if that tree is infested until um, especially looking at it from the ground which most of us probably would be yeah um, the first signs of infestation is a die off in the canopy so the emerald ash borer particularly um, when it arrives at a tree it will start um, attacking the young part of the tree which is at the canopy and um, you will see notice that branches are dying off at the youngest uh, extent of the tree so you might notice uh, a once tree that was lush with leaves the year before or a couple years before has now shown a significant of the canopy has died and not necessarily due to storm damage or broken branches just you know normally healthy branch undamaged um, suddenly dead. Um, so you can keep a lookout for that. Another one, if you have a bucket truck and you're up there in the canopy, you can look for those D-shaped holes. And that is when the adult uh, insect burrows out of the bark and exits the tree to fly off to another part of the tree or to another tree altogether. Um, and uh, so once it gets down to eye level, where you and I are most likely to observe the exit holes, it is a very, um, it's probably about the size, like a thumbtack, if not smaller, like a small thumbtack um, shape. And there are um, pest detector programs that I would recommend everyone if we can't we can't read that it's through um osu's extension office has a oregon forest pest detector field guide and um, a whole um, like workshop where they train regular citizens like you and me how to identify the insect itself um, galleries in the wood um, how to detect it visually and um, what to do um, to make sure you're accurately identifying it and then what to do after you've it. Um, so it's a both free. I highly recommend um, on this committee as well as others in the city and other citizens to check it out. It's free um, and it's been getting more and more interested people participating um, for this reason. So the more people that observe 
and find and identify EAB, the better chance we have of reducing the likelihood of it having a major impact all at once. So we're not going to be able to avoid it. We're not going to be able to eradicate it. We can try to be resilient to it. And we can try to be and try to have plans and anticipate what we'll do once it does here. So any other questions about that? Would it be worthwhile something up, maybe have it on the web page? Also, I don't know, maybe put it in the, the water bills or in the local news things that go out. Uh, asking people, just citizens, to look at ash tree, see like tops of the trees or the tips of the branch. Do they get yellow when they're dying? And so, I mean, because for years people have been keeping, that's how we know where Dutch elm disease is. Both, and, and I've got a walnut tree, and if I see the branches starting to yellow, I freak out. Um, so that's how we've been able to do some of these pests. It, would it be worthwhile alerting the public just in general to keep an eye on ash trees. And if they start seeing it yellowing, have could contact the city and somebody could go out and verify that, yes, it was the emerald ash borer or not. So there are resources, um, experts that can be reached out to. Um, so unless there's someone like that on the city yeah. staff, um, I wouldn't say don't tell the city, but I would say, I don't know if anyone on the city, it would be the right person to ask is this emerald ash borer, right? So you want to know for sure. Um, and this would be valuable information for the city to have, of course. So if a citizen did ask a staff person, I think I have emerald ash borer, how do I know? There's folks to um, reach out to that the state wants us to notify right away if we think we have um, a, an infestation here. So um, we can, so I would re recommend every staff person that has uh, relationship with trees to go ahead and check out the state's uh, pest emerald ash borer plan that they can be up to date with whatever the state is uh, pursuing in terms of protocols and expert to reach out to for this. So we have a state um, entomologist, Christine Buell, she's excellent person to know. Um, and then we have a USD um, or ODA re resident, um, not resident, um, expert as well. I don't know that person um, personally. So um, but I'm sure they're a good person to know. So there are experts and resources the state actively wants us to use if we have a concern or we think we case. Um, and the city should definitely be aware of those. Uh, but then we can also provide them to the residents as well so that the more people know, have awareness and what to do if they think they have an infestation, they know who to call and that we're calling the right people and not just asking someone who's got to ask another person who's got to ask another person. Um, so having that resource available and easily accessible for anybody would be valuable. Yeah. Does the county have anybody on Sorry, staff Nancy. or? I wouldn't expect the county to have any, but um, any specific um, OSU extension would be valuable. Like they have a direct relationship, um, especially to the pest detector program, which is run by extension. So if you're interested in becoming more aware, more knowledgeable about how to identify EAB, go to extension and check out their forest pest detector workshop and sign up. I'm wondering if the city could approach the extension service to see if they could help with the costs of printing a flyer or of some kind that could go into the utility bills. Uh, utility billing hits about 13, I don't know how many households it hits, but um, probably around 13,000 households. Um, and the costs of printing something would be significant, but you know, somewhere. Right. It so, could even be a link that would be, that might just, be like, uh, not just a flyer would be great just so that it's right there in front of people and they don't have to find, like do an extra step to find the information. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having a link to um, more pictures, more identif identifiers would be good to, to put in a water bill. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. Yeah, definitely reach out to a, um, our extension office here in town. I'm just thinking a really 
large picture of an emerald ash borer <laughs> with its mouth parts open. Right. <laughs> so I think people. it would be valuable for people to know what the emerald ash borer for sure looks like. Yeah. Um, but also what the tree, right? You know, as the tree looks yeah, like. The ID for when, the tree. What do ash trees look like? Yeah. Yeah. What it, does an ash tree look like? like um what does it look like when it's in its you know initial stages of being attacked or in its full like when it's been it for five years what does that look like other key identifying uh characteristics would be valuable and um yeah is it it would affect the uh, raywood ash the street tree ash mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. see quite a bit around oregon city yeah. as well i assume yeah um Okay. Yeah, we have a variety of ashes in the state, and um, as far as I know, they're all particularly vulnerable. They have an step that the state is asking cities to do um, is to, in effort to be prepared, is to know in advance what your ash tree and boy looks like, where it's located, and um, how many you have, because that's going to be important to know when an emerald ash borer gets here for insurance FEMA purposes, if that makes sense. So I'm talking mm -hmm. financial reimbursement um, because when emerald ash borer came to Michigan, it was devastating, not just to the trees and the street trees and the living experience of living with a bunch of dead trees. It was also financially expensive. Um, yeah. and it, and it doesn't go away. It is not insignificant. And especially um, if you just kind of wait and let the wave roll over you, cost of not be was even more expensive than being hurt and taking the time to be um, ready for it and to be resilient against it. So that means... Um, insecticide treatments in targeted areas um, and and also taking the time to do a good inventory so that you know how many trees are you going to have to manage over time or protect against uh, that, that pest. So having an inventory, not just for knowing where your trees are, but also how much you're going to have to replant eventually, how much you're going to have to manage or mitigate and then also how much potential costs to uh, ask for reimbursement for FEMA. You got to know what damage you have before you can ask for any money back for it. Mm -hmm. One really big problem with it also is that Oregon white ash is one of the major riparian trees. And so particularly along a lot of the smaller creeks, they'll be almost entirely ash trees there you know there'll be some alders and some cottonwoods but they're really important and then those trees die the water heats up and the fish you know the survival of fish then goes down because the water heats up and the oxygen levels drop and so i would think the the local watershed people would be really really concerned about this and you know Exactly. So it's going to have an impact in a variety of areas, not just the street trees or the urban environments, but also the ecological environment. It's a key species in habitat, not only for providing shade in riparian areas, but also it provides habitat and food for a number of wildlife. Mm -hmm. So we're going to lose a major um, component of our habitats over time and so that would mean it's going to be it's going to resonate um it's not going to go away either so we can't we won't expect it just come and then go it'll when it gets here it's here and we can do the best we can to be prepared and um have a plan in place for what to do uh to mitigate the initial attack but also what to do when trees start to die off and how we're going to handle that wood waste yeah. and um, financial expenses attached to that. So being aware, having an inventory um, and having processes established in place to then deal with it 
is going to mean the difference of a Chris versus Dev. <laughs> that makes sense. I'm not trying to over, mm-hmm. uh, exaggerate. But, um, coming from Michigan, um, I didn't know what an act tree looked like until I moved. I, we were driving across country and we hit Montana. Yeah. Um, so that means children um, should get to know their ash now before they won't recognize them anymore. So that's just my personal experience. Anyway. I know it's in Missouri and it's hitting Missouri really hard because my brother runs. So I've got friends there who are like just wiping out the ash trees left and right. So they're yeah. all working to figure out what to plant instead. In, a lot of the areas in Missouri, even and along the streets. Right. So I, I just want to emphasize to city staff and anybody watching this um, to be please be more aware and make it a priority um, because from places where it arrived and there was no plan, there was no awareness. It was a major component of the forest, and if you don't know what you have and then it's gone, you certainly know when it's gone. Yeah. And then it's very, very difficult to manage when it's there and very expensive. So I'm just trying to think both financially and ecologically. And, you know, as a person that lives in the city, um, it's going to hit under of uh, all those areas. Yeah. And uh, the better prepared we can be, the more financially resilient we can be, which is responsible to our citizens and also responsible to um, the landscape we're trying to steward. Well, Samantha, Sam, thanks very much for raising the alarm. Um, I, I take this seriously and I'm sure that um, we can get the get the word out um, to the uh, community. Um, and I don't think this is going to be easy. I think it is going to hit hard. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity to try to have an ounce of prevention being a pound of cure here. Um, and so uh, John Lewis, but uh, we will follow up and uh, uh, come back in September with some more information. In the meantime, um, I am going to probably uh, ask you to take the web page based on the template that the city of Portland has. And before we publish it, I'll just send it around to you guys for some input. Um, We're just really lucky that the uh, one of the pest people, invasive pest people for the city of Portland happened to go to Forest Grove for one of his children's athletic events and looked at the trees and went, oh, those ash trees. Who was that? I can't remember the That's name. Do you remember the person's name? Uh, Gina Dick and Nick Desai. It was a it was male, I believe. Mm. But I don't yeah. remember. I just remember reading that. Well, that was yeah. that was really good. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because the last I heard, it was in Colorado. Dom- and I, Dominic well, Mays. Well, maybe five years. What was it? Dominic Mays. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Good. Yeah, and I think he's a forest entomologist as far as, like, he's the, an expert um, and has a lot of experience with EAB from, like, previous work with the past. So it was kind of, you're right, Nancy, it's, it's rather fortuitous mm-hmm. that he happened to be someplace. Um, but, uh, but just for everyone's awareness, um, Emerald ash borer does have seasons of when they fly and they don't fly right now in August. Mm. Um, so if you see any emerald green beetle, it's probably not emerald ash borer now, but keep your eyes peeled in the spring um, and uh, early parts of the summer uh, next season. So that you, so if you see a shiny green beetle, it's probably not emerald ash borer. You can take a picture and send it to um the relevant contacts that are listed on the Oregon Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan, but um, it's probably not Emerald Ash Borer right now. Well, while we're while we're got a, got YouTube, I can at least uh, 
share my screen and show a picture of the borer. Um, I, I found an insect site for Oregon and somebody posted a emerald greedle and I looked at it wasn't an emerald ash borer. And so then I went and found the picture of the emerald ash borer so I could look at that beetle compared to it. And it was different. So, but yeah, also, Pete, if you, if you Google, Google, um, just Emerald Ash Borer, Oregon, one of the first hits, BB, it's the article, um, the details, uh, what Dominic found, and there's actually a picture of the D-shaped exit hole mm. um, uh -huh. in Forest Grove, and there's a really good picture of you, an Emerald Ash Borer. Do you want to share your screen and show us? Uh, yeah. Let me do this. Share uh, it says I've got, uh, I need to be enabled. You have to let him, oh, yeah, let me let him share. share. I will let share. Multiple can share. There you go. It should work. All righty. So here's the article. This is the D-shaped hole. So, oh. yeah. Wow. I wonder if it was there based on what Sam was saying for the infestation was there for a while because, I mean, that, I don't know. Who knows? He could be in a bucket truck, right? But it kind of looks lower, but it's definitely D-shaped. And then that's a solid macro mm -hmm. photo. Mm -hmm. So honestly, probably better than what I, that I could I could look at a beetle and say, but, you know. Yeah. 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 Pretty interesting article. And that's the larva form. Okay. Does anyone happen to have a good photo of an ash tree that they could share so that people know what tree they should be looking at um, versus like an oak? Or uh, I've got a few. Um, we can certainly make sure we've got up to date links to the OSU landscape trees website as well. I don't well think as I have any good ash trees, and I don't know why, because, yeah. I might just embed the pictures right in the city website. Yeah. But, so, knowing um, what an ash tree looks yeah. like is a is key to know what you're looking at um, when you're trying to invite, uh, see if you have a ash borer. Yeah. Um, and then, so crown dieback, seeing a loss of leaves in the canopy, but also seeing woodpecker damage is a big indicator on an ash tree that it's likely infested um, because they're going after that larva. Um, so that's another indicator I forgot to mention. Right, okay, okay. All right, so a couple of future agenda items that I, I, I've got a list of, of things here that <laughs> have sat. Okay. Um, Thimble Creek Upland Habitat Heritage Tree designations, checking with Rose Holden and the Southworth family to see mm -hmm. what status is of their application and following right. up with that. Um, nuisance plant and native plant list updates um, lists have not been updated, but the definition of a nuisance plant have been updated in the code, but we have not updated our local lists. While you were gone, I looked at potentially doing it because Clackamas County has a great website nuisance plant lists and part of the problem is the scientific names have changed so the stuff on ours isn't half the scientific names are wrong compared mm. to what they it's just it was a nightmare I finally gave up trying to do it <laughs> but we had the question before is there any way to link in to that county website mm. and and everybody was saying I think Laura was still here and she was saying well the problem is is that this is for developers but is there like saying that as of like this date, like maybe the first of every year you, you're using that list? And if you've already started your development, you're in whatever list you were in before. I, mean, I don't know how to do that because that's an ever-changing list because they're adding things mm -hmm. as they determine that they're invasive. And so I know that's a problem for, for developers. And so mm -hmm. that was that's something we probably should discuss because that's going to be the most up to date and that way we don't have to keep a separate Yeah, list. I don't I, I agree. It's a whole lot of sense for one city in this region to have its own list when it's obviously a regional yeah. um, thing that needs updating. Um, and you know to that and that's the reason why we were to 
the Portland native plant or the Portland plan list, sorry, and extension service and the Clackamas uh, bead wise program and those kinds of. But the county a list but that the county has a list. PC program with a really good list. Okay. Good to know. Um, so if we could somehow just look to that, that would be the yeah. ultimate if we could do that. That, that would be easy. Um, I'll I don't see if I can find that. That I'll send only, you know, I think it's just a general information yeah. thing. I'll send you, I know I've got the link somewhere, and so I'll find and send it to you. Okay. So. Yeah, it does need to be, uh, you know, if we go with an official, if we officially adopt, you know, the county line, we do it through right. resolution, I think. Um, uh, we'll need to discuss that with Aquila, right. um, but right. uh, put it on the agenda. Uh, the other items are um, tree removal code and canopy coverage discussion, which is a very big subject. Okay. Um, they have, uh, you know, four separate code sections now. I think the idea would was to try to at least consolidate those into one section with, you know, you're going to have a public tree code section probably, and you're going to have a uh, on-site um, tree code. It's kind of like we have right now, but it's just going to be a little more efficient. Uh, mitigation standards, I would assume, would be a little more standardized, potentially. I, I'm totally spitballing this at this point in time, you know. Um, it's, it's such early days, and we would need to do some significant public outreach. Mm -hmm. But that's on the list. Um, and then, uh, let's see, fall planting for Friends of Trees program. They are uh, planning to do that. I need to give you guys an update on that. We'll provide that at the next meeting. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. we don't have an invasive species list. That's on the list here, too. And that could okay. be, that's another situation. We have a nuisance where we've... plant list, and a lot of the nuisance plants are invasive, but not all, you know, like yeah. poison oak is yeah. on there, and so. Yeah, yeah, so that would be, yeah, worth looking at. Uh, and then I also see tree plotter and tree inventory on this list. Um, and, you know, right now it sounds like there would be a, an emphasis on attempting to prioritize the uh, ash population. But, um, and I don't know how much discussion occurred while I, I was gone about uh, doing a tree inventory. Um, we had we had an entire meeting where we talked about it. We had, uh, Sam had people come who did a presentation and, mm -hmm. The problem is, is that we really need somebody at the city level who can really coordinate if, you know, even if we're doing citizens doing a tree inventory, um, we need people at the city level who can help coordinate that. And so we came up with the idea we really need an urban forester, which I think that maybe should be on our future agenda items as well to talk about yeah. the, the, the plant, the the planning session we went to of the city commission. Um, but I think in order to get that, I, we really need to do some kind of a cost benefit analysis. You know, how much is it going to cost the city and what are the benefits? I mean, with the Emerald Ash Board, it becomes even a bigger benefit to have one of those because then we'd know where, you know, as these pests show up, we'd know where all the ashes are and potentially all where all the maples are when that one gets here because that's up in Washington somewhere. And so, you know, yeah. But, but we really need to to have a cost benefit analysis to to be able to convince the city commission. I think. Right, and as I understand it, most of that discussion uh, has led by the public works director so far, uh, or at least it. Uh, he's been involved with that. Yeah, John involved with that and okay 
So I'll, I'll circle back with John. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any other items that we wanted to get on the radar as we move into the fall? Well, let's do another. They could have a, maybe have the city come and talk to the Emerald Ashbor, get John and yeah. Mate to come. Yep. Yeah, that's already on the horizon. So, and then at some point we were going to do the the planning one. <laughs> oh yeah, I think that is most important because there's so many different levels of decision making in land use. Mm -hmm. um, there's some that planning, you know, planning for authorized to approve based on clear and objective standards over the counter, and then there are others that go to the type type three and type four level right. and become more discretionary. They go up the chain. Right. Um, yeah. Remember, we had to talk about the type three and whether whether the Natural Resource Committee was supposed to review all of those. And my understanding was that we decided it was. And I ran into uh, Doug Neely and we had a discussion and his recollection was the same thing, was that we had decided that the Natural Resource Committee should review all of the type threes okay. and type twos if possible if it's within the window of when we're having a meeting. Oh, if but for okay. sure, type three. Yeah. 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 I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know how that's uh, through the cracks, but it's not in the code and it was supposed to be put in there. Yeah. I think it was, it was in the code and it go as a type three decision, but it, the NRC is not mentioned. Right. Uh, it's the plan. Right. So that's where the gap is. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, good to know. And okay, type three. And rod decisions. I'm just, we've got a big list here. Yeah, we do. We'll have to decide on priorities. Right. Um, okay. Anything else? Or is that good for now? I have another one that we should probably put on the list, but it doesn't have to be at the top. Is um, more planning for Arbor Day. Oh, oh, sorry. So we wanted to do something more, you know, organized for Arbor Day next year. Yep. Um, so now that we have a little time, um, <clears throat> it'd be good to just put it on the list so that we don't forget about it the month of May, or Arbor Month, rather. Because there were grants we could have applied for to do things. And right. So yeah. the grants time we come out, out, there were grants, it was too late and we were too yeah, and and not think, just grants, but also just ideas so that we have yeah. like a, a plan in place. I think it's, and then it's we a, can tell that on the grant application. And a coordination with PRAC as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. because um, several years ago, um, John Waverly kind of took over the Arbor Day celebration and organization. And um, in our bylaws, it says we need to meet yearly with PRAC and PRAC's bylaws, it doesn't say anything like oh. that. Um, so there's always been this bit of a disconnect in that regard. Um, and we PRAC to one of our meetings? Yeah, I think that's the best way to yeah. do it is get PRAC up to in front of us and then us up in front of PRAC at right. some point and, 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 uh, and try Try to just coordinate on Arbor Day as well, because if uh, I think a lot of times that you know it's going to be in a city park, so PRAC should be involved as well. So, um, uh, yeah, really good. Thanks for reminding me on that. Piece. All right. Well, that's all I have. If there's any other news you guys would love to sh like to share, please do. The only other thing I'd like to share is the opportunity for folks interested in learning more about urban forestry uh, topics is the Partners and Community Forestry Conference is a national conference. It it's Seattle this year. It skips around the entire country, so it's relatively convenient this year. And um, they have presentations and workshops on urban forestry, as well as Urban Wood Network is a partner with them. 
So they will also have a workshop. Um, so becoming more aware of urban wood salvage and utilization would be very valuable for any Oregon municipality um, in anticipation of wood coming out of our canopy. So um, it's in November and it's a great conference. I've never been before. I went to a virtual one the other year, but um, I'm always hearing good things that it's an excellent conference. So it's relatively conveniently located this year. Good. I check it out. Thank and if you need any um, professional CEUs, I think they serve credit for those as well for anybody who has those um, interests. I need some. <laughs> now that I'm an arborist. Hey. Yeah. So it's an excellent one. I'm going to go. So yeah. we could be conference buddies um, <laughs> along our of my co colleagues at OCT um, and ODF. So definitely consider November. if you, it's at November 15th and 16th in Seattle. Okay. So registration is open. Okay. Thank you. All right. So when are we going to discuss the interview with um, right. Good point. Um, Convening and we stay a little bit longer and. I yep, I'm happy to step out. Um, yeah, <laughs> happy to step out. Thanks for nice participating, to meet you. Emily. <laughs> Thank you. All right, signing off. Bye. Should we turn off the video? Yeah, I think we can probably deliberate off camera yeah. in, in this case. Um, Willamette Falls Video Studios, can you guys, um, basically, I think we just need to convene a meeting and, and talk about it. But um, 